trying to think of the bad joke, but um, I'm not so sure you would get it. <laughs> All right, so it's a beautiful day to celebrate our dads, but also to worship and celebrate our Heavenly Father as well. Amen. I'd like to welcome everyone to the North Region of the Greater Philadelphia Church of Christ, and if you're visiting with us today, an extra warm welcome to you. And please don't be shy. If you have a moment when service ends, feel free to introduce yourself. We're happy to have you. My name is Ty Beast, and to share a little bit about myself, and for those who don't know, I really enjoy karaoke, so I'm going to try to hold back. Right now. So, um, I'm not in any way a professional singer, but I'm a strong singer, and I like to tell those who know that when I sing karaoke, I own it. <laughs> I don't know if time permits, and I find it to be a lot of fun, so if you get a chance, give it a shot. Yeah. So as you see, we do sing quite a bit here, and I love when we sing together. The clapping, the synchronized body swaying, you know, Harvey, Harvey and yeah, you know, you guys over there, I watch you guys often. Um, and I just love the smiles that come from when we sing together. Um, Ephesians 19.20 says, Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything mm -hmm. in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in Psalm 98, it says, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth, burst into jubilant song with music. So no matter your background or skill set, shy or outspoken, I invite you to sing mm -hmm. from your heart today. As we remember our earthly dads on this Father's Day and shower them with love, shout and give thanks and love to our God, Father in heaven. All right, let us pray. Come on, Walter. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And certainly happy Father's Day to all. And uh, Sean Mayer was actually the one that was going to be bringing you communion today. But Sean came down sick this morning. And so uh, prayers are with him and the family. Hope he's having as good a Father's Day as he can. And, you know, we all get to celebrate our dads. We get to have a time right now to reflect, to enjoy being together, but to, in particular, focus on the cross. And, you know, it's a, a special time for us as dads. I'm very encouraged to have my son, Brandon, and his family with us here today. They're normally in the Havertown region, but they to spend time together with me and then we can go and have a traditional Father's Day lunch afterwards, so looking forward to that. Um, you know, dads, uh, we, we do a lot, but a lot of it, I think by design, is supposed to be in the background. You know, usurping mom is not a good move. Moms are awesome, and Mother's Days are awesome, and uh, you know, we don't have the dads stand up, we don't give you flowers, we don't think, do things like, although I think a year ago we gave you dad joke cards, but uh, we're not even doing that this year because, you know, there is the proper sort of place for everybody. And I think in some ways it's appropriate for dads to be in the background, but to still be there. You know, even when you think about uh, Jesus' parents, which by the way, we don't often think of Jesus that way, but he had parents. But certainly Mary, we know a whole lot more about than Joseph, right? Mm -hmm. And once again, I think that's by design. Uh, I'm not, we're not sure what happened to Joseph. Uh, but you certainly get the impression that he had an uh, impact on Jesus in his life at an early age. You know, this is an opportunity for us to think about our earthly fathers. Kim and I just got back uh, last night from celebrating our 40th wedding anniversary. So this is a busy weekend for us. But Kim, and by the way, uh, a lot of our folks today are at camp. For those of you that are here from the Bring Your Neighbor Day last Sunday, this is quite a contrast. Uh, a lot of our, our gang helps out with camp, and Kim is there today. But Kim, for our 40th, put together a picture album for me and for us, and it was very reflective not only of our marriage but of our families, and certainly she included in there some pictures of my dad. And my dad passed away in 1997. And I tell you, those pictures bring back memories. Uh, my dad, who I respected so much, who was very much a part of my life, and uh, was one of two best men in my wedding. Uh, we were that 
that close. And yet, once again, he was a little bit in the background. Uh, he didn't try to take the place of mom. He didn't try to be the life of the party or the guy that's up front all the time. And yet, all four of us, me and my three siblings, knew that he was there when needed. When you think about our Heavenly Father, you know, from a Jewish perspective, God was not really thought of as Father. In fact, biblically, the words that are mentioned for God the most in Hebrew, of course, we got Adonai, which is Lord God, referring to the supremacy of God. Yahweh, the name of God, used most often in the Old Testament. And then El Shaddai, which means God Almighty, the all-sufficient and all-bountiful God. Those were the images that the Israelites, that the Jews had of God. That he was all powerful, that he was reigning, that he was the king, that he was in charge. And that's certainly who God is, all powerful. And yet when Jesus came on the stage, when Jesus began to bring in the new covenants, that changed. Because Jesus really was one of the very first that referred to God not only as Adonai or El Shaddai, but as Father. And that was very different for the people of that time. To think of God not just as a superhero or a, an avenging God that was going to deal with your enemies, but to think of God as, once again, maybe not always in the forefront, but always there when needed, sometimes in the background. When we look in the book of Luke, in chapter 23, and Jesus is going through his agony on the cross, it says in verse 44, Now it was about the sixth hour, and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he said this, he breathed his last. He said, Father, Abba, Daddy in our vernacular. You know, that's the, the reference, Papa. Um, you know, that, that most cultures have an affectionate term for their physical father. And Jesus, when he's on the cross, does not say El Shaddai, Yahweh, Adonai. But he says, Abba, Father, Daddy. If you go to the Gospel of John, we see after the death and the burial, there is the resurrection. And of course, the disciples are trying to get their heads around it. They figured it had been a good three-year run. But now Jesus was gone. They go to the tomb to finish the burial because of the Sabbath. And when they get there, the stone has been rolled away. And the women are there in particular. And in the account in John, Jesus actually has a conversation with Mary. She doesn't realize it's Jesus. She thinks it's the gardener, the one that would have taken care of the whole area of the tombs and making sure thing, everything was in order. And Jesus comes up to her and says, Woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? She said, Sir, if you carried him away, tell me where you put him, and I will get him. Which, if you think about it, that's quite an image as well. She was going to go put the body over her shoulder and bring it back to the town. I mean, it's kind of a, a crazy notion that she had. I'm going to finish the physical burial myself. But then in verse 16, Jesus says just one word, Mary. He says her name. Like a father talking to a child. Just mentioning her name as he'd done so many times before. Jesus turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And then here it is. Jesus said, do not hold on to me for I have not yet returned to the father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I'm returning to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mm -hmm. We are so blessed 
because we have a relationship not with the distant creator of the universe, not with a vengeful, all supreme superhero God. Certainly he has power, he has authority, he put it all into existence. But he's our father. We can go to him at any time. He may be in the background, but he's there. And during this time of communion, we have the chance to reflect on that, to think about it. I do realize that some of us didn't have the best experiences with our earthly fathers. Well, there's hope. And the hope is that you can have a tremendous experience and relationship with our Heavenly Father. That's right. Amen. That's right. Father, well, thank you that we can call you Abba Father, Daddy, Papa. That you have us pause during our busy lives once a week to remember that you cared enough to send your son to watch your son go through the agony and the torture of the cross, but then to be resurrected victorious over the grave and over death so that we can have a relationship with you, our Father. We are eternally grateful for that. We don't want to take it for granted. We realize that sometimes we leave you in the background, that you're just there when we need you, but thank you for always being there. We love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now we'll just have a time of meditation. Amen. Good morning, good morning, church. Good morning, Evan. How are you guys feeling? All right. I also wanted to echo uh, how awesome it was last Sunday to be at Temple Ambler at our outreach service. How awesome was that? It was great. Yeah. to be back here in Jeremy's Town Academy, but um, it was a tremendous time, just the festivals. Uh, festivities, the games, the food, the fellowship, um, but it is good to be back here, and yes, as well, I wanted to say happy Father's Day to all the dads. I do love my dad as well. He's where I get my corniness and my silliness from, uh, and uh, he loves puns, right? And so I've actually, I know Tybis was debating, I've been given a free pass to use a lot of dad jokes, but uh, I won't use that many, but uh, it's funny, I don't, I don't uh, always tell dad jokes, but when I do, he laughs. <laughs> ben, all right? We're warming up. That was a, that was a warm up joke, all right? Did you catch that? A little bit. A little bit. Okay, okay. See, it's corny, it's corny. But no, me and my dad actually celebrated our birthdays uh, recently, uh, and so we both share a June birthday. So we were on the phone the other day, just kind of reflecting about life uh, and just how far we've come, my dad and him as a boy now into uh, where he's at now. And for myself as a baby, I was born in Hawaii uh, as a baby. And actually, fun fact, did you guys know that in Hawaii, it's actually illegal to laugh loudly? Did you know that? You actually you have to keep it to an aloha. <laughs> That's, uh, that's actually the extent of it, so you guys are, that's all I prepared for you guys. Everything else is for free and just by the Spirit, but um, no, but you know, me now, I celebrated my 26th birthday, and so it's, it's, uh, it's one of those times where I'm with, I'm talking to my parents, and now I'm off my parents' health insurance, wow. so I'm like, geez, we're here already, yeah, praise God, <laughs> but we're here already, and uh, I'm off the insurance, and it's in times like these, birthdays or what have you, where you really reflect on life, and you really think about it, life is a lot quicker than we think it is sometimes, isn't it? Life is, it moves, it's, it's uncertain, time is uncertain, time be flying, right? <laughs> time flies, and so that's actually the title of my message today, is Time Flies. We'll see if this sermon flies, probably not. But we'll be in God's Word today. We're going to continue, as uh, Walter said, in our series of Ecclesiastes in chapter 11. As he said, we're almost there. We're almost done. One more chapter to go next week. But we're in chapter 11 this morning, continuing our series, if you're new with us, in the book of Ecclesiastes. And if you remember, kind of, or are familiar with the book, the central idea that Solomon is kind of getting at throughout the book of Ecclesiastes is this concept of 
the vanity of life. Right? In other words, life is meaningless, he says. It's, it's hevel, it's smoke, it's fog. Don't put your hope in life, right? Because it will not end up satisfying you the way we want, the way we need. You, you won't find what you're looking for in life, right? And, and it can sound kind of dreary, but when we think about it, and for those of us that have been on this trek with the author Solomon, answering and diving into the questions of life, yeah, in fact, we can kind of... Uh, 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 relate to the fact that, yeah, to strive in life with us knowing without God in the picture, right, without God at the center, without God in the equation, then, yeah, God, that life seems pretty purposeless, right? It seems pretty pretty foggy, grasping at that fog. Sometimes it's, it's with empty return, without God. However, in this chapter, in chapter 11, that message of this vanity of life, Solomon doesn't want us to misunderstand and, and use that as a reason or justification to then shut down or withdraw in life. Right? That even though life is, is meaningless sometimes and can return empty, we're not to slip back into a passive type of lifestyle. And so, you know, as much as Solomon has been warning us often about the danger of foolish actions in this life and what that can result to and our consequences of that, and we've been learning from his mistakes. I, think, I believe in this passage, now he's warning us about the dangers of foolish inaction in this lifetime and, and the consequences of that. Amen? And so let's, let's read here in, in Ecclesiastes chapter 6, starting in verse, or chapter 11, starting in verse 1 to 6. It says, He says, Ship your grain across the sea, and after many days you may receive a return. Invest in seven ventures, yes, in eight, for you do not know what disaster may come upon the land. If clouds are full of water, they pour rain on the earth. Whether a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where it falls, there it will lie. And whoever watches the wind will not plant. Whoever looks at the clouds will not reap. And as you, do, as you do not know the path of the wind or how the body is formed in a mother's womb, so you cannot understand the work of God, the maker of all things, sow your seed in the morning and at evening let your hands not be idle either, for you do not know which will succeed whether this or that, or whether both will do equally well. You know, there's some things Solomon's addressing where, there's some things in life where things are certain, right? We know certain things are going to happen. But then most of the time in life, there are things that are just plain uncertain, right? And so my first point for us this morning, just two points, is in life there's high risk, but there's also high reward. There's high risk, high reward. And so at the beginning of this passage, what is Solomon doing? He's kind of painting this picture or this venture. He says, ship your grain across the sea. And I know over time and through different translations, there's many interpretations of this. But I believe, and, and through research in this, that he's, he's addressing overseas trade, right? You would, you would put your bread back then or work on the ships and send them out onto the seas to get back a return, to get back different goods. Right? And so when you think about overseas trade, though, in those days, there was a lot of uncertainty <laughs> that came yeah. with overseas trade. Yeah. You think about it. You know, for today, I, the other day, ordered a <coughs> pair of sunglasses, right? It's summertime. I need a new pair of shades. So I ordered a pair online, and immediately, what have I presented with? A confirmation email with a, a tracking number, right, that I can use to, every step of the way, follow where my package is at each destination until it gets to my house. It's pretty amazing, right, that we have that capability today. But back then, when you, would, when you would put something on a ship, you had no clue when that ship would get to its destination, right? There was no updates about where your cargo was. There was no delivery notifications, right? You wouldn't find out for days, Solomon says, whether the ship would get there, not to mention make the trade, and is your profits or good even coming back to you? Maybe you'd have to figure out through letter or whatever. But it'd be a lot of waiting, and it'd be a risky, high-risk venture to put this good on a ship and cast it out into the sea. But as risky as it was for those traders back then, those sea traders, they saw it as worth it. They saw it as very worth it, despite the wait. Why? Because first of all, what other option did they have, right? I mean, this was their labor. What, am I not going to do anything, not get goods for my labor? I'm not going to put my, my, my goods out there and spread it out from my local area. They're like, I need fruit for my labor. I need the profit. 
but it took being bold, right? It took a little courage to trust that my sh ship of goods is going to get to where it needs to go and come back, right? It took some courage because they understood that, well, me, for me to just not do anything and be passive would actually result in, in foolishness. It seemed foolish to them to not do anything. And the reason I, I say that, I'm reminded of a story in Matthew chapter 25 in the Gospel of Matthew. And uh, Jesus tells this parable, and maybe we know it as, uh, there it is, the parable of the talents, or the, the bags of gold, or the three servants uh, in some translations. And so what happens is Jesus is telling this parable about a businessman, right, about a master who goes away on travel. And, and, but when he goes away on travel, he's very wealthy, but he decides to leave some money with three servants, right? And two of the servants take the money that they have, and what do they? What do we remember they do? They, they actually risk the money, and they decide to invest it. They decide to invest it, in, and because of that, they gained a greater return than what they had to start with. And so the master, the businessman, comes back, and, uh, and, and he asks them, you know, where his money is at, and, he, and the, the two servants present the money to him, but more than they had at the beginning. And what is, the, what is the master's reaction? He praises them. He celebrates them. And he tells them the response that I believe we all want to hear one day is, Well done, good and faithful servant. Why? Because you were faithful with what I gave you, and now you have more than when you started with. But what happened to the third servant? He goes over to the other servant, and he says, What have you done with my money? And the third servant did something a little different. He kept the money to himself. He actually didn't decide to risk it, but he dug a hole and put the money in the ground, in the ground and, and said, I, I hid your money, sir, because I was afraid that if, if I invested it, I would lose it, and then we'd have nothing. So he hid it in the ground. And I, you think about it, if you were this third servant, this servant probably thought he was doing the right thing, yeah. right? He probably was like, yeah, this is safe, this is secure. To keep and, and to keep this to myself, to hide it in the ground, so that we don't have no money. But to his surprise, the master and his reaction was not celebration and was not praise. He was actually very disappointed, and actually met him with rebuke. He met him with rebuke. He actually he said, "You wicked, lazy servant." He said, "How could you be so lazy with what I've given you?" And he says in verse twenty nine, "Why did he say that?" He, in the NLT, it says, to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But for those who do nothing, even the little they have will be taken away. What, why, what, what's Jesus trying to say? What is he getting at? Well, at the beginning, he says, this is a story that illustrates the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, the kingdom that we're in to this day. You know, you think about it for us. I think we can often think of Christianity as just this comfortable living, right? Safe and security. And, and in Christ, don't get me wrong, there is absolutely a sense of security and peace of mind that we are presented because of God. But for those of us that are following Jesus, we know that the Christian life is still a roller coaster. Can I get an amen? amen. It still has its ups and downs. Yes. It's still an adventure that, that, that is riddled with challenges. And, and, and riddled with things changing all the time. Mm -hmm. Riddled with risks to be taken. But I think the issue and the danger for some of us is that the last real risk we've taken in our lives was that initial decision to follow Jesus. Mm -hmm. And even now we play it safe and we just continue to coast now that we're saved. Yeah. Right? <laughs> That's kind of the danger that we can seep into. Right. Because if we know Jesus, he, he didn't play it safe. Right? His life was not comfortable. Sure, he was confident because he was with God. He was God. But he still knew that work had to be done. Right? And I think for us, we can't hide what God has given us. Come on, we have to be willing to take risks. Take high risks. And invest it. And what I mean is invest it in other people. Right? As much, you think about it, as, as the risk that people took for you and the investment that they put in you, how dare we now have received this richness, a saving relationship with God and just keep it to ourselves? Right? We have to invest That's right. in others 
But it, it, it's risky. It's scary. Very. But Jesus did this because he knew that there are people that are still wrestling. There are people that still need this great spiritual wealth. Yes. Right. And so we have to take risks. In verse 4, Solomon says in chapter 11, he says, Whoever watches the wind will not plant. Whoever's just staring at the clouds will not reap. Yeah. Right? There's this story about Satan and his demons. Right? They come together and they have this meeting and uh, about plotting how to, how to deter the world away from God. And then one of the demons comes up to Satan and says, I think I've got an idea. What if, we, what if we say God doesn't exist? There's no heaven. There's no God. And Satan's like, that's probably the worst idea I've ever heard. <laughs> Have you looked around? Look at all that is around us that's around you. Of course God exists. Of course he created heaven and earth. G give me a new one. I need a new one. And so another, another demon comes to Satan and says, all right, what if we tell them that you don't exist? So that'll do it, right? And he's like, okay, I was wrong. That's even worse than the first. <laughs> you see all the evil in the world? Of course I exist. Of course there is a hell. Of course I am here. But he's like, I, I, you got to do better than that. And so finally another a demon comes up and says, you know what? I think I've got it. How about we just tell him to wait? How about we just say, hey, take your time. There's no rush. There's no reason to hurry. There's no reason to hurry into a relationship with God or to obey God. Just wait. And Satan's like, bingo. That's a great idea. That will work. And why does that work? Because when we feel like there's no reason to hurry and we're just waiting all the time, well, nothing's happening. Yeah. Nothing good is happening. And that's why Satan, that's what Satan's up to a lot of the times. Yeah, he's working his evil. But for us who know that we probably shouldn't do evil, well, there's still things to do. And if we're not doing anything, Satan's still rejoicing. Yeah. But he's like, we can have this mentality, there's no reason to hurry. But we think that that's okay. And you know, there's, there's definitely truth to pace in life. I'm not saying if you go, go, go all the time. But if we just have this mentality of there's no reason to hurry, well, we think about it and justify it because we just feel like we need certainty, though. <laughs> like everything needs to align. Right? Everything has to be strong and perfect before we venture. But we've got to also realize that it's the notion that the one who waits for certainty will often wait forever. Wow. Right? Waiting for everything to be just perfect or just right is really a dream <laughs> when you think about it. It's not reality, this type of perfection on earth here. Well, how do we relate to that? What is reality for us? some things to apply. You know, I think about the singles and, and single men like myself and single men and women who are waiting to get married until everything is perfect. They'll remain single if we wait for this type of per perfection. I can struggle with that. Or Christians maybe who wait to get involved in ministry or, or any serving opportunity until all the problems are solved will remain on the sidelines forever. Right? We'll just, if, if we're waiting for everything, all the issues in the church or things in our community to be solved before we step up and serve, what good is that? Yeah. Right. If everyone's on the sidelines, then nothing's getting done. Yeah. But for someone that youth, works in the youth ministry, I think about you guys as parents, right? I understand that for some of you as parents, it's your children, it's your kids that feel like the risk. Mm -hmm. What do I mean by that is, you know, it's, it's easy to just wait for your kids to be exposed to God in his church. And why is that easy sometimes? Well, we don't want to pressure our kids. We certainly don't want to do that, right? Pressuring our kids into, into faith, that doesn't work. But when you think about it in, in this, when he says, and alludes to laziness, right? Not necessarily laziness, but when you think about, okay, we know high risk high reward. That makes sense. But if we're also on the flip side, just living life with low risk, then often in return, we're just, we're going to have low reward. And so we've, we've got to take risks. And I, what am I saying is I, I believe that, and maybe more than ever, families need to prioritize the kingdom. There's a need for families 
In this community and in this church to prioritize the kingdom of God. That's right. That's right. For their entire family and for their children. That's right. Because I think the problem is, is that, yeah, we, we understand shipping our grain across the sea and the uncertainty of that. But we're willing to take those risks. I think we understand high risk, high reward. And some of us are doing it pretty well. And what do I mean by that is, is you know, yeah, I take, I take risks in, in, in my life. I, I, I take risks at my job so I can, why, well, climb the corporate ladder and get to that high position and get the money I feel like I deserve. Yeah, I take risks so I can get the reward and the money here in life. Or maybe it's for us as, as parents or family. Yeah, no, I invest in my kids. And, uh, you know, I might keep them from that church event, but, yeah, they're, they're in all these sports so that they can make the all-star team or that they can, they can uh, get that scholarship. I, well, I'm, I'm living high risk, high reward. But what's the issue is it, it's earthly, it's worldly. That's right. If we're just worried about, is our kid on the all-star team or am I getting that higher position? Right, because, and don't get me wrong, I mean, these things we can make an impact with. These things hold weight, these things hold value, but at the end of the day, guys, what are we doing, what are we aiming for is not earth, we're aiming for heaven. Yeah. Yeah. And our purpose yeah. is to be with God in heaven one day, and that's certainly what God wants for us. Yeah. But our, we're not aiming for what's here on earth, the earthly rewards. Our reward is higher, and that's something I appreciate about my dad, not just his humor, but he, he didn't pressure me into becoming a disciple. He didn't even talk to me about studying the Bible. He, he didn't even force me to go to church events. But what he did do is he planted the seed. And what he did do is he lived by example. And what he did do is make himself available every time I needed a ride to events. And he would always be there to chauffeur me around. Because what he understood that the relationships and the friendships that I would gain that are godly at, at, at these teen ministry events... And, and being exposed to God's word, that eventually my heart would change. And you know what it did over time. And I appreciate my dad for that. But in, in, in Galatians chapter 6, Paul reminds, that, reminds us that whoever sows to please their flesh, well, from their flesh will reap what? Destruction. But whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap, will reap what? Eternal life. And so therefore, let us not become weary in doing what is good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. And that is a promise, church, that we, at the proper time, will reap a harvest if we do not give up. And what is this harvest? What is this high reward? It's eternal life. It's heaven. It's worth it. Not earthly high risk, high reward, but spiritual high risk. Spiritual high reward. My question for you guys this morning is, what is God calling you to risk? What is God calling you to risk right now this morning? Is it that job? Is it that relationship? Is it speaking up and having that conversation with that person about your faith? Is it actually for yourself digging deeper into the Bible and seeking after God? What is God calling you to risk? Because we don't want to live life with regrets. Right at the end of the day. We want to enjoy our lives. Amen? amen? We want to, to enjoy our lives confidently. And so my second and final point is rejoice well. Rejoice well. You guys still with me? Yeah. So let's finish out this chapter in 11, starting in verse 7. Solomon says, Light is sweet, and it pleases the eyes to see the sun. However many years, However many years anyone may live, let them enjoy them all. But let them remember the days of darkness, for they will be many. For everything to come is meaningless. You who are young, be happy while you're young. Yeah, let your heart give you joy in the days of your youth. Follow the ways of your heart and whatever your eyes see. But know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. So then banish anxiety from your heart and cast off the troubles of your body. For youth and vigor are meaningless. Rejoice well. You know... It's advice that Solomon's giving to the old and the young. In verse 8, he said, he's saying, however many years that you end up living, enjoy them all. Please, enjoy them all. He's petitioning us to enjoy our lives. Those who are young, be happy while you're young. And let your heart give you joy. It's like, yeah, follow the ways of your heart. But also know that at the end of the day, God's going to judge you. <laughs> That's what he says. He says, yeah, go after and enjoy your lives. Do what you want. Follow your heart. But just remember that God's going to take into account everything that you've done. 
but rejoice. And so Solomon now is almost warning us to be careful how we enjoy life and how we rejoice, right? We can rejoice in life, and I think we should rejoice in life. Yeah. And we all know people that rejoice. Everyone does. Everyone rejoices in some fashion, whether we know it or not. Mm -hmm. But I think the issue is that some of us, the issue is what we choose to rejoice in, yeah. what we're rejoicing about, right? And I think a lot of times we keep it at rejoicing of only what's on the surface. Mm -hmm. And why do I say that? How do, how do I know that? As Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 25, he says, They traded the truth, meaning they, they meaning those that do wicked, they traded the truth about God for a lie, so they worshiped and serve the things that God created instead of the creator himself who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. Amen. So what's, what's the issue is that for us as humans, oftentimes where we can go wrong, and the reason why God's anger is revealed to us over the course of history, as you read the scriptures from Old Testament to New, is, is not the, the wrong thing is not the fact that we are rejoicing at all or enjoying our earthly lives. Jesus says, have, you know, I want you to have life to the full. But the issue pertains to where we choose to rejoice in, and that's when we only rejoice in the creation and not the creator who created everything, Amen. and not giving glory to him, and not rejoicing in the, the creator that gave you those skills, that gave you those talents, that you can do what you do, or, or that gave you those opportunities to accomplish what you've achieved. That is where the issue lies, and that is why I say rejoice well. That's where the issue lies, is when we know more about our favorite sports teams, our favorite celebrities, and all of their stats and achievements, and we celebrate and invest in that more than we celebrate and invest in the Word of God that can thoroughly equip us for every good work. That is where the issue lies. Not that we rejoice, but what are we rejoicing in? Why are we rejoicing? Or maybe we feel like we're doing good works. Evan, this is not really my mentality. Well, even when we're doing good works... You know, something for, I, I can wrestle with, you know, especially working in the ministry, and I'm in a lot of Bible studies, and I'm helping people become Christians yeah. and getting baptized. But yet, in my, the first thought I, I can have in my head is like, yes, Evan got another one. <laughs> look, wow. we just baptized another teen, amen. Look what I did. <laughs> when it's like, no, I didn't do anything. <laughs> All I did was plant that seed. And point them to that scripture in God's word. Because we, as we know, it, it's God that does the watering. It's God that does the growing. Praise God that this soul is saved. But is that our mentality? And so all Sol Solomon's saying is, hey, yeah, enjoy life, but be careful. Just be careful. Because are you getting the credit? Or is God getting the credit? And he almost kind of baits us. He says in verse 9, follow the ways of your heart. Yeah, follow the ways of your heart. Whatever you see, do it. But I think despite what media pushes and in the, sh the things that we see in our kids' shirts, we need to be careful to not simply follow our own hearts. And, and you know, I think about when I was a kid. One of my favorite movies was uh, The Sandlot. Does anyone know The Sandlot? Oh, yeah. One of my favorite movies. Very nostalgic to me. It's just a movie about these kids in this neighborhood that play baseball. And it's awesome. And it's still one of my favorite movies to today. But there's a, a scene in there that I'll never forget. There's one of this characters named Benny the Jet Rodriguez. And he idolizes this great baseball player, if you've ever heard of him, Babe Ruth. And he, uh, he uh, you guys heard? But he um, appears in Benny's dream. He has a dream about Babe Ruth. And he, he imparts Babe Ruth these words of wisdom onto to Benny that, I, that I've never forgotten. And he says, Benny, heroes... They get remembered. Legends never die. But follow your heart, kid, and you will never go wrong. And Benny's there like, yeah, okay. What do I do? And we can hear this wisdom word like this and be fired up and be like, yeah, that sounds sick. And I, me as a kid listening to that, I'm like, I want to be a baseball player. This is awesome. <laughs> but uh, what's the issue with what he said? Is that he said, follow your way, follow your heart, kid, in what? You will never go wrong. That is false. <laughs> and why is that false? Because Jesus says it himself in the book of Mark, in the gospel of Mark. He says, it is from within that evil comes. It is from our own hearts that evil thoughts can come. Right? We've got to be careful that we don't just follow our hearts. 
That's bad advice. And don't get me wrong, God, I do believe, can put dreams and vision on our hearts. Mm-hmm. We can do good with our hearts. But we've got we've to navigate what is of God or, or what is yeah. just of this world. Right. Or just for ourselves. Yeah. We've got to be wow. careful. But for me as a kid hearing that, I followed that advice. I was like, yeah, I'm going to rejoice in this. I'm going to value in this and what I saw. And what I saw was, was girls. And what I saw was, was friendships. Uh, and what I saw was um, popularity. I wanted popularity and I pursued those things. But it was until in high school when I came into contact, when someone said, did you want to study the Bible? And came into contact with God's word and what Jesus did for me, I, it transformed and rocked my world. It transformed my mentality. That I, became, I got baptized in high school and changed my ways and started rejoicing in God. And I was fired up and I took the risk to go to college in Kentucky, out of state. And so I'm fired up and I'm there my freshman year, ready to take on the world. But then, as a, just a, a puny freshman, life hits again. And I start to drift back. I'm not really making friends as easily as I thought. I, I, I thought it was my skill to make friends. But I'm, I, and things aren't working out. I'm like, did I make a wrong decision coming here? Like, this is the worst. But it was until a brother in the campus ministry sat me down and had to humble me out. He said, dude, you're not thinking like Jesus right now. You're just thinking about yourself and what you can gain and how much knowledge you had coming into college. But I had to be humbled and aligned with Jesus. And that changed me. And and I grew so much in college that I'm fired up and I take another risk and I want to serve the full-time ministry. And I come here to Philadelphia to work with the youth ministry. But okay. But amen, but, but in that time, the world is shutting down <laughs> at that exact time. So I'm like, this is awesome, but what the heck is going on? I, I, not only am, am I not rejoicing in God, I'm not really rejoicing in anything on earth. I'm like, this is rough. <laughs> but it was until I was persistent, but yet looked around me and saw teens still studying the Bible. And still wanting to study the Bible. And still understanding what Jesus did for them. And it it cut them to the hearts. And teens were still getting baptized. Not because of me. But because of God. Even during a pandemic. Jesus was still changing them. And I'm like, oh yeah. God. (laughs) Praise God. I could rejoice in God. Why do I share all that? Again. Because I think we're prone to wander. Us as humans. We just wander around sometimes. And we've got to be careful that we are prone to wander too. And at every step of that journey I shared with you, what always brought me back was, was being reminded of Jesus. Was being reminded of the gospel of Jesus. But, but even as people who, are, who know the gospel, even gospel people can be prone to wander away from the gospel. And, and Paul knew that. And he, he shared that with the Corinthian church in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. He says, now brothers and sisters... I want to remind you of the gospel of Jesus I preached to you, which you have already received and are currently taking your stand. But it's by this gospel of Jesus, meaning the good news of Christ, of him dying and forgiving our sins, but resurrecting from the dead. It is only because of this that you are saved. If what? You hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Meaning we can loosen the grip. We can wander. We need to hold firmly to what does he say specifically? The gospel of Jesus. The good news about Christ. You might be asking, how do I take risks, Evan? How do I make sure I'm rejoicing properly? We need to be reminded of the gospel of Jesus. And that's where he kind of gets into chapter 12, which I'll save for next week. But he says, for us, it's when we remember the gospel of Jesus. That's when we start to remember oh, and give credit to God. Like, oh man, yeah, what he's done for me. He's created me. He loves me. And it's only then that we can rejoice in life despite our age and despite the things going on. And thus we're more inclined to take risks or, or leaps of faith. You see what I'm saying? It's this cycle. But we first need to remember so that we can rejoice so that we can retake risks. Amen? Amen? That's kind of how it plays out. But, but how do we do that? Is when we know what, who we've been created to be. So ending here. As we land this plane in Romans chapter 8, I wanted to remind us all of what Paul says to them. He says, listen, who shall separate us from the love of Christ, really? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? 
As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. And we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But no, in all things we are what? More than conquerors through him who loved us. We are more than conquerors through Jesus who loved us. I know we hear this a lot. But please let this sink in. That we are, it's saying, the conquerors of the earth that we know about, we are more than them. We can conquer more here on earth because of Jesus who loved us. That no matter what is happening in our lives currently, the tragedies and the hardships, that we have overwhelming victory. Overwhelming victory is ours already when we choose to invest in Jesus and give credit where credit is due. Yeah, it's a high risk to follow Jesus, church, but the reward is so high That's right. as well. And what we become is more than conquerors. And, and I'll leave you with this, that when we remember Jesus, with Jesus, the future is bright. Amen? <laughs> Maybe you don't believe that now, but think about it as you, as you walk out this church. You have to pray about it, maybe. But with Jesus, despite the bleakness of things right now, the future is bright, no matter how much time we have. But why is the future bright? Because of Jesus. As each hour passes, think about it, we're that much closer to meeting our maker of all things. And so what do we need to do is we need to make the most of the time that we have here. Because time's uncertain. But thankfully, our creator is a loving God, is a loving father, as is shared about today. Who longs for his creation to be with him in heaven ultimately one day? Therefore, church, we don't have to worry. We don't have to fear the uncertainty of our lives. Take healthy risks, but remember to rejoice in God because time flies. Amen? Let's, uh, let's sip, let's, and remember that. Let's, let's bow our heads and pray as we close out our service here before one final song. Uh, God, Heavenly Father, you are our Father. You are Abba, and we thank you for your mercy on us. We thank you for desiring us to be with you in heaven one day. We thank you for the many ways that you're just working in our lives. But God, it's, it's, it's hard out here, and you know that. There's a lot of scary things that are happening, but God, help us to remember Jesus. Thank you for sending Jesus and, 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 and showing us you, how much you love us. But I pray that we invest in Jesus, or if we know people who still need Jesus, that we invest in them so that we all can receive not the reward, but just what you want to give us out of the graciousness of your heart. And that's heaven, God. Help us to rejoice in you, to give credit where credit is due. God, I thank you for all that you are doing and all that we get to do because of you. Father, I love you. I thank you for this church family. I pray that this really helps souls that come straight from your word. Um, you are awesome, and I pray all of this in your son's name today. Amen. Amen. Let us rise, let us sing before we are dismissed today.